The rationalists and neoclassicals say the selfish gene dominates. We defect because we think it's our personal interest to defect. And if we defect all, we get, in a, we get something, but we get something very suboptimal, as you just explained to us. Or we may get nothing at all, or we get the reverse, as you see in the, in the famous elaboration of the game. And then the economists got criticized heavily for that, and behavioral economics is back and very powerful. And they say people are learning, and uh, we can change and uh, we may not always be driven by self-interest, and they go back to the biologists and use their methods and their methodologies to prove that. So you see a lively debate there. Then you see a very lively debate among the psychologists, and we have uh, here, uh, Michael Tomasello, who lives in Leipzig, and does fantastic and fascinating experiments with primates and very young children. And I think, is he here, Daniel Hahn? No, not yet. He's coming tomorrow. He is one of his very excellent disciples. And they are troubled by what is innate in these young children and the transition from primates to humans and what is environmental learned through culture, economics, social differentiation, and what have, it, have you. And then you have all the other humanities that deal with the same topic. So it is one that preoccupies us on the academic side across a very wide spectrum of disciplines. I don't give up my hope. I don't want to believe that the prisoner's dilemma is the only, even if real, outcome we can work with, we have to work with. So I wonder, when I, when I go to the second topic, which is the big challenges ahead of us that require cooperation, whether we can't do better, not only identifying the problem, but use academic research to also find solutions to these problems. I think that is a long shot but something we should bear in mind and keep definitely on our agenda. We heard one way to a solution, which is the coordination game, which is a simpler game, you said, and it doesn't need a treaty. Now, it's remarkable how you work yourself to the elements of every, all the details of every treaty to find out what the missing elements are and what the constructive elements are. And the Montreal Protocol, which is a treaty, is a very positive uh, uh, example. And what it shows us is that you have many players, so it does work among many players, and that you need upfront or during the negotiations process to set very clearly not only what your objectives are, to which normally all, everybody agrees, but also what the sticks and the carrots are in order to see whether you get enough adherence or compliance to those and you made it very clear that the trade restrictions were the tipping point for continued uh, cooperation. I guess we have just witnessed yesterday the passing of two different important deadlines for global cooperation or regional cooperation. One, the press, particularly in Germany, is loaded with, or in Europe is loaded with, and the other one is less noted, but also extremely important, and that is the nuclear agreement with Iran. On the more pre present one to all of us, the Greek one, one wonders what happens. And if we go into repeated prisoner dilemma games, we also have to look at how we negotiate. When two hard positions negotiate that start from irre irreconcilable bases, would you really have seriously expected that they would have come out with a joint outcome on Sunday evening? They negotiated to the point of 400 million difference, which is peanuts in the context we are talking about. But it didn't happen. And perhaps there is a lesson here, not only that you repeat the game and the game 
again and again, but they also reposition and rebase that game. And we will see what happens next and whether this is doable. Now, a very short comment, so I'm not too long in between the great presentation and your open discussion and your own points. The coordination game. Oh, no, let me go back to the negotiations because I think it picks up on something you said, Scott. I took the famous negotiation course that is run by Harvard University. I think Harvard must have made a lot of money, or at least some people must have a lot of money on that case. It's a great course. I recommend it to everybody. It's excellent. And it plays all these games with you. You know, and you're sitting right in the middle of it, and you make every mistake. I mean, everything you said, you do. Then I went into the negotiations for the projects I was responsible for. And I asked myself yesterday as I prepared for today, did it make a difference? How I negotiated or didn't it make a difference? And I think sometimes it did, and sometimes it did not. I could always explain the outcome. And that has something to do with you get with both win-win situations and failed-failed situations, that everybody has a rational argument for the outcome. But did I, do, did I ever fully understand the motivation behind my, the opposite side on the table of why things worked and why things did not work. And I want to give you an example that is very current in Germany too, which is a word that's being exported and entering international vocabulary. It's called Energiewende. Energiewende in Germany means that between different choices of energy supply, particularly electricity supply, you have the choice of solar and wind. And we use that choice of solar and wind deliberately to make a contribution to reduce our CO2 emissions, or perhaps trading them off for more emissions somewhere else. Best, the worst outcome is neutral, the best outcome is less. A counterpart to that is North Africa and the Middle East, an area in the world which has plenty of sunshine and enormous potential in solar energy. But also countries that have huge deficits in their daily energy supplies, whether it's electricity, fuel, or what have you. If these countries go and decide, decide to meet their current and future needs through solar energy or wind energy, I wonder whether they do that in order to make a contribution to climate change. So I wonder they would put the red chip into your negotiations game. Why would they? They're on a development path, and this may be just their best option. And a lovely, nice byproduct is less emissions. But I wouldn't count on it that this will always be the case. There may be alternatives too, and they may choose those over solar. So I think even if we get the same move into the same direction, as you said, we can agree on the facts, but it's very difficult to understand what is behind the facts. Now, a comment on the coordination game. I happen to know one coordination game reasonably well. It's called the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, and that really started not even as a game. It started as a real coordination effort. You had three critical inputs you needed, and you had three groups that brought them together. A scientist who developed the draft variety of wheat. There was a good variety of wheat to plant in famine-prone India. You had a minister in India who was a scientist himself, or is still a scientist, very known, who said, this is a fantastic idea, and convinced his reluctant government to go ahead with it. And you had what I call a couple of wise men sitting in Washington, D.C. They were all men, and they represented the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Secretary of the Treasury, and the head of the World Bank. And they said, okay, this is huge. We have funded. it. We have fund the research that continues to go into it, and we fund the investments needed to execute that idea. And it worked, and the rest is history. You all know it under the Green Revolution. That was great. Fantastic, simple coordination effort. 
It led to the creation of a system, no treaty, all voluntary. But this system doesn't work as well anymore as a coordination game. Why? Because the distribution of voice, the certainty and uncertainty, the information available and the information not available is very unevenly distributed among the different players. And the most critical players, for whom the whole effort is intended, doesn't barely have a seat at the table. That coordination game runs the risk of not working very well if nothing happens. And I wonder, and I don't have a great answer to it yet, but that requires an effort of coordination, some firmer kind of, I won't say treaty, but framework under which it operates, or whether we can rebase it to the original coordination effort. But it is so dominated by those who sit on the resources, on the funds, that it gives the others not the amount of say they should have in playing that coordination game effectively. So even there, I fear there might be, even if it's great, you have wonderful examples at work, but if you extend the N in your fur example from four to 15 or 20, it may have looked different. Um, I think we shouldn't be pessimistic, but I think I have four things I want to say as a final word. Lord May, the professor at Oxford and a former scientific advisor to the government of the UK, once made a wonderful statement. After six days of discussing scientific approaches to climate change reduction and uh, climate change initiatives in agriculture, he said, now we have spent two thirds of our day on the easy stuff. Now we have one third of the day left for those who have to do the heavy lifting. And these are the social scientists. And of course, the social scientists had nothing close to offer in terms of specificity of what could be done, as the scientists said. What do I take away from this? Four roles. Let the scientists go back to what I said first. We research it across the board. Let the scientists do be the inventors. Let the social scientists, as academics, be the innovators. Let the policy analysts and policy advisors be the synthesizers and uh, integrators. And ask the politicians who actually make these decisions to think more about the trade-off between the long term and the short term. Even if or because we are going to be dead in the long run. So on that note, not pessimistic, hopefully a little bit optimistic, I turn it over to you. So, Margaret, thank you very much for your comments um, and your, the way you always bridge theory, conceptual thinking, analytic um, reflections and um, the real world. You know, this has been very uh, instructive and, and helpful for us. I would suggest that we have a very brief round actually uh, here at the panel. Uh, I would have one question that uh, I would like to, to answer to both of you and then I would like to move towards the auditorium because we have uh, 100 people around, all experts. You know, so we should use your brains and your ideas and your questions. Uh, to push this debate uh, forward this evening. So uh, Scott and, and Margaret then also, the, the question which I have, which is based on what you said at the very beginning, Scott, you said we have so many facts, so many figures, so many data, but it's not so easy to, to understand which story we are actually in, where, where we stand in this whole process. And my, my question is related to this uh, first point you started with. No? And, my perception is that if you were, when we ask the question, are we on the way to global cooperation or never ever, you know, there are three different uh, perceptions or kinds of interpretation to explain where we are and where we stand. No? There, is a, there is something like a school or a group of scholars and people and observers, Tomasello actually is one of those, no? arguing that we might run into complexity uh, issues which are beyond our capabilities. So social cognitive boundaries or cognitive boundaries 
scale is something which you mentioned. No? So we might fail. This might be too big for us. We might, might need to think about processes of smarter deglobalization. So there is a discussion on that. No, this is too big for us. Uh, there is a second uh, type of interpretation, if I understood stood you right, um, and this would be the question, Scott. Uh, you are arguing in, into this direction. Um, cooperation is so diffic difficult. If we would have a perfect international system, so it's something like a democratic world government or something, we would behave uh, smart. But we don't have that. And if we, as we don't see how to get from A to B, uh, we start with um, smaller solutions, coordination games. Uh, this might help us to solve part of the problems, but it's, it is not attempting, uh, attempting at uh, cr create, re reflecting on how a global cooperation architecture then might look like. So is this the way I understood you. No? Then there is a third um, kind of interpretation. We have Tom Hale here. You just published a book or two years ago or so. Why cooperation fails when we needed it most. If I understood you right, your kind of interpretation is that uh, we are in a situation of tr big transformation. It's, it's only 20 years or 25 years. It's globalization, accelerating globalization, uh, huge power shifts, the Earth system stuff. So everything becoming global, and we are coming from a period of 250 years of national sovereignty thinking. So we might need more time to learn this kind of transformation. No, to, and to develop bit, with bits and pieces these new rules and new procedures, routines, to shift prisoner dilemmas, dilemmata situations, into simpler coordination games. No? So these are the three types of observations which I, which I observe. My question is, uh, what do you both think where we, where we stand, actually? Because if we would share the observation that cooperation on the global level, because of a series of reasons, is very improbable, Shouldn't we then make uh, the second step and say, okay, let's think about smart deglobalization? How might it look like? No? If we opt for the other um, scenarios, we would have other kinds of reflections in mind. This would be the kind of question I would like to ask you to reflect uh, upon for a second. And then I would like to move directly to the auditorium. So please be prepared now. No? Scott. That was a very, um, <laughs> very deep uh, question. You know, I, I basically, I, I agree with the point that when we need cooperation the most, we I mean, that's the basic result I had. I wrote down a game theory model in 1989. That was the conclusion. Uh, I think there's something there. Uh, I think the world is, uh, is, is more complex, and you can pull out from these stories. Um, what I think you get, you have individual stories. Some of them are, are amazingly uplifting, smallpox eradication. Some of them... Uh, I think are deeply discouraging. I think the climate talks, which I've been very involved in for a very long time, is extremely discouraging how that has gone. Um, so you've got that whole range, and I think the important thing is to develop a consistent way of thinking that can explain the full range and not just a particular part of it. The way I see things is um, there has been unprecedented change. We've been on a movement for millennia really, but certainly over the last uh, 150 years especially, towards higher and higher scale, extraordinary population growth, expansion in incomes, including alleviation in poverty in much of the world, uh, but an increased footprint of humanity everywhere. You have the a lot of these pollutants and problems accumulate. They build up. They don't disappear. Carbon dioxide, you put it in the atmosphere, 20% of it stays there thousands of years. It's a worst long-term problem, the nuclear waste storage. These things keep accumulating. And our institution, technology advances, it changes very rapidly. Our institutions do not change as quickly. They do not change as quickly. And I think that's part of the problem. Sometimes when people explain, they'll say, well, you know, if, if we don't succeed in Paris, then it's over. I don't know what they mean by that, because if we don't succeed in Paris, we're going to meet again in the next year in some other city, and it's always going to continue that way. Why? Because the problem hasn't gone away, so we're going to, we're going to persist. But what will happen is the more we fail at these issues, the more it accumulates, and then we're just forcing other things to happen. And I think what the international system does is it goes for what works. And I think we have to be prepared to think a little differently about what's going to work. 
Uh, for example, suppose that climate change does unravel and come out the way that some scientists fear is possible. What are we going to do then? Uh, well, one possibility is we're going to change our behavior and we're going to reduce emissions. Of course, at that point, it's too late in, this, in the... Well, well it'd be good... At, given that we're at that point, we can do, it would be of some benefit, of course, but you can't undo immediately what was done before. But there are other interventions, and this is what I think is going to be happening in the future. There's a technique called geoengineering, where you throw particles into the stratosphere to reflect light away from the Earth. This is a technology that is within the capability of at least a dozen countries today. And I think that if things were to get sufficiently bad, you'll see countries do that. Why? Because it can be done unilaterally. Does that mean that cooperation isn't needed? No. In fact, there you've got a huge governance problem. One country can act in a way to change the climate for everyone. Who gets to decide? That's a fundamental governance problem. The point I'm trying to make is uh, if we don't confront the challenges we have now, it, they're just going to be, there are going to be efforts to try to address them in another way. And the first instinct of countries and what countries are good at, apart from coordination, is unilateralism. And of course, unilateralism can be harmful. So I, I think that what we're on is a kind of evolutionary path. I don't see it as being something that's deeply stable, that's easy to predict. I don't see it as uh, moving necessarily in a good direction. I'm not, I'm not a pessimist. I don't think it's necessarily moving in a bad direction. I think there are forces that will reflect the interests of the states, efforts to cooperate, efforts to coordinate, unilateral actions when they'll work. And that the key thing is going to be advancing the, the institutions so that they're able to uh, uh, channel uh, the, those behaviors. The, the last thing I want to say is, you know, ultimately, um, I do think that if you get more and more convergence of value uh, or we face problems that become more and more catastrophic, I'm not sure what other word to use, under those circumstances, I think countries are willing to do things they have not been willing to do in the past. I mean, actually, their response to the um, Euro crisis is, is one example of that. So I think you're going to see uh, uh, some changes taking place in the future, as they have in the past. The United Nations, where did that come from? World War II. So, I mean, you're going to see innovations that may be hard to imagine today, but the idea that they're going to come on time and uh, give us what we need when we need it, I think that's something we can't rely on. Thank you very much, Scott. This is working now? Yeah. Um, Margaret, for you, r related to what uh, Scott just said, no? do you see any chances for substituting catastrophes as drivers of cooperation and big change and transformation by knowledge creation? I mean, <laughs> will the knowledge which we have and accumulate help to substitute the, the basic driver in history for these kind of social inventions? No? Do you see trends, or do we have to wait for the next big catastrophe and crisis to make these uh, shifts happen? I mean, that's a crystal ball. I don't know. I have seen the world jump into action at an immense, enormous speed when we were faced with the avian flu catastrophe. And that really drives home that catastrophic, potential catastrophic events bring out a lot of cooperative action within no time. So that makes me think a little bit more positive. I think there is definitely that capacity. Does it always have to wait to the point where you think it's almost too late to act? I don't know. I think the Ebola crisis woke up the world that just focusing on three diseases because you're worried about them is not going to solve the spread of communicable disease. And I would hope that one of the lessons is that with that knowledge, and that the knowledge available to deal with these problems can be used effectively, which gets me into how we, and it's unfortunate to say, your point on the institutions is very well taken. The institutions are lagging behind. I mean, it's frightening to see how long it takes to get some action at all on the governance of the IMF or the World Bank. 
I mean, it's impossible. And as long as these governance changes are not made, you are not having a representative sample of global decision maker as the arbitrator between all these cooperative issues. You will not have that. You know, so I think that is something one can work on that looks like a very tangible thing, criterion for me, and maybe the Euro crisis shakes something up here. I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't. Or I would be surprised if it did, didn't. But uh, I think the, the slowness of the institutions is a very big problem. I think the knowledge creation is our hope, because the more knowledge you have on how how you reduce uncertainty and how close you are to assessing whether a catastrophic event is possible or not might, I would think, with everybody being rational, should help. Yeah, thank you very much, Margaret. I would like to open up the discussion now to, uh, to you, and uh, you have the chance to ask questions, make comments. I would um, prolong our debate for 10, 15 more minutes, no? so 8, 15, 8, 20, because I'm I'm seeing that all of you are still excited uh, to ask questions to our two fantastic presenters uh, here. So please, um, you have the floor now. I see the first question here on the left-hand side. Yes, Hi, and uh, please uh, present yourself briefly. Oh, thank you, Bruce Gilley from Portland State University. Just a point of clarification. How does scaling down to a sectoral approach to climate change solve the coordination problem? Because it wasn't clear to me why scaling down does anything to shift us onto the coordination side of your game? We, we select some, is that fine? Or we, we bought some, some. David. Thank you. I, I found that a, was an excellent presentation. Really enjoyed it. My fear is that your pessimism uh, shone through while your optimism wasn't given a chance to shine through. Uh, so I would have liked to have heard more optimistic uh, scenarios rather than the more pessimistic. My concern is that it gives fuel to our leaders to justify not taking appropriate action. I, I'm from a, the country that hasn't quite grown up yet, Canada, and we have leaders who are choosing to opt out, uh, opt out of Kyoto, opt out of the desertification treaty and so on. And they're doing it based on the arguments that you've made, that these are essentially talk shops, that these are uh, agendas that are not going to lead to productive outcomes. So. I would have hoped that you'd speak a little bit to the domestic audience that is in a position to change not only the viewpoints of the leaders who are making these decisions to renege or opt out, but also in a, in a position to remove them from power and choose leaders, uh, in a, at least in a democratic system, uh, who are more open to the kind of changes that you're, you're speaking of. Thank you, David. Uh, Klaus Legeby, the last question for the first round. Mm -hmm. I would like to make a point for a globally binding treaty, Kyoto type, um, because uh, I'm not so naive to think that it will really bind sovereign nations, but because I think that it can really connect and bind together as a framework. Those clubs, this is one solution, or those sectoral solutions you started with A, aircraft, uh, aluminium, how, so how long is your list and how these elements of your list where you are able to coordinate easier. I understand fully and appreciate your approach, but nevertheless, I would think you would have a kind of framework to get to bring these things together. Club solutions are very, in, in a way, are rather idiosync can be rather, rather idiosyncratic. Uh, sectoral solutions can really focus on uh, one important point, but there are backlashes, there are non-intended effects, uh, so it may be, might even be worse if we focus just on that point. So I think on a symbolic level, a collectively binding treaty in Paris might be, the, and I would be in favor of getting rid of these two uh, presidents, co-presidents of the uh, the negotiations when they, you, you, you never start a soccer game, even if you play Afghanistan against Germany, without thinking I can, I can win the game. And you're not supposed to say in, the, in advance, I will lose anyway, so let's start the game. Okay. Thank you very much, Klaus. So, Scott, would you like to start and Margaret to yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, follow? Can you, hear, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. So, just on the last point, I want to be clear. Um, they were not uh, pessimistic about the overall outcome 
they were pessimistic about the, the review process. But the review process is the only thing I see in Paris that's at all novel. By the way, the idea of the review process, that began in 1991. So, you know, maybe I should be optimistic, but I've watched this carefully. We've been going round and round and round, and we keep trying to do the same thing, and we expect a different result. I don't think that's the only thing I would do. I have other suggestions. Now, on the first point about the coordination games, uh, so I did explain that if you take the hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, and you control them under the Montreal Protocol, they don't deplete the ozone layer, that's why they're not there now. But we know the Montreal Protocol works, the HFCs have the same commercial properties that drive the mechanism, a binding treaty that's needed for coordination on the Montreal Protocol. So I'm 100% confident you put those in, it'll work. Now, the HFCs are included in the Kyoto Protocol, they're in the Doha Amendment, uh, we've not controlled them. That approach has not worked. But if we took that same gas that's under Kyoto and put it in this agreement, which is specific, this amendment would be specific to HFCs, that would work. Okay. So we could do better. That's the key point. Now, we look for other opportunities like that. And I don't pretend to have the entire list. I would love to be funded to put together a team to actually write a lot of treaties because I think what we need are a lot of treaties dealing with different sectors and gases. But let me just give you one example because I, I can understand why you asked the question. One of the sources of emissions is aluminum or aluminum production. And uh, of course, energy is used in making aluminum, but it's also true that the process itself using an anode, and please don't expect me to explain everything. It's very hard to understand the epidemiology of polio and then understand the engineering of aluminum. I can't do everything, but basically I've read enough that there's an alternative answer. So the anode we use now results in the emissions of perfluorocarbons, which are another greenhouse gas, PFCs. There's an alternative process being developed using something called an inert anode. If you use that one, you get rid of all the PFC emissions. So what I would recommend, and I've actually um, raised this with aluminum, the aluminum industry, uh, is that you have a standard that says that all, the treaty would be written like this, all aluminum production must use the new anode, okay? Um, the agreement would cover not just producers of aluminum, but also consumers, meaning countries that import aluminum. So now you would be restricted if you were an importer only from importing from countries that have agreed to replace the current anode with the inert anode, okay? And you would back this entire thing up with a trade restriction. So countries that were outside the agreement could not trade with countries that are inside the agreement. That's why a treaty is needed in this case. It's not like smallpox or polio. Um, that would work, okay? No, you don't, okay, so you do HFCs, you do aluminum PFCs, now let's go for the design of aircraft. Actually, Obama made an announcement, I was really quite surprised about this, on uh, aircraft. Uh, it's, it, as you know, Europe has tried to limit emissions from international aviation. Actually, it's very hard to do. I mean, the way to do it is to get people to stop flying, which is probably not gonna be very popular. Uh, the alternatives are complex, but a way to do it that, that, you could, that would concentrate on that sector would be uh, further and further improvements in efficiency. Okay. So there have been some improvements, but I'm talking about pushing this process along to address the global public good problem. And the uh, international organization ICAO is very good at implementing technical standards. They've done that over, uh, I could go on and on. This is a coordination problem the world is good at. So I need to go through a long list of things like that. Okay. Now, uh, jumping to your point, you, you do want to uh, not just have these things sort of out there independently, but you want to gather them up in some way. That was, I think, the point you're making. So I would be in favor of a lot of these sub-agreements. Um, and the nice thing about this is each one can go forward without any interference. It doesn't have to harm any of the other ones. Um, and if there's a problem anywhere, it won't contaminate the other ones. That, that's actually a great advantage. You do want something that sort of connects them all because you don't want them to sort of hang out there independently. Uh, and you want to connect them all, you want to see where um, it's possible to coordinate across sectors and so on. 
the, the areas where I think we can succeed are precisely those sectors that are exposed to trade, which are actually the areas that most countries have been reluctant to do unilaterally. So one thing that would happen with this approach is you're going to take out the bits that are more exposed to globalization, and you're going to leave the bits that are most available to countries to control on their own without fear of this so-called leakage problem. And there, I think internal politics can actually be more successful. Because one of the concerns now is, well, we act and they don't act, and then we not only don't address the problem, but actually jobs and other things move towards other countries. That's self-defeating. This you would get away with, you, you reduce some of that. Some of the things that you know, Margaret pointed to, where you, you, you can see that there is some effective cooperation, I think that would be enabled somewhat there. Uh, in the end, okay, so now I want to come to the, the question you asked here. Now, I, I speak about, okay, I'm obsessed with this. I stay up every night working on this, thinking about this. I'm tormented. I, I, you know, I, I, I drink. I, I vacillate between hopefulness and trying to find successes and also um, uh, not despair. I'm actually quite determined every morning I get up to try to, to work on this. Uh, I, I teach younger people. I want to make sure I don't depress them. I don't make them cynical. That would be the worst thing of all. Uh, at the same time, I think we have to be completely realistic. Now, Canada withdrew from the Kyoto Protocol. Why? Because given that it had ratified the treaty and had not adopted policies to meet it, uh, it was in its self-interest to do that. I'm not excusing it. I don't say it's a good thing to do. But I think the problem isn't with Canada, just like I think the problem is not with the United States for not ratifying the agreement. I, I don't support what the United States did. Don't, you know, don't think that's what I think. The problem fundamentally is the agreement. The agreement was written in such a way that the United States could get away with not signing it. The agreement was written in such a way that to bring it into force, they had to offer sweet deals to Canada, Japan, and Russia so that they would come in. And then when things became complicated for Canada, the, 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 the most, um, uh, you know, the easiest thing for Canada to do was to pull out. That's what the theories I've worked on say. It's, it's not, I, I don't think, I, I wish the, you know, governments read my theories. I don't think they do. I think the theories are capturing something that's quite deep. And what I don't want, what I will not do myself, and I don't think people should do, is whitewash, and I'm, you're not suggesting this, don't you, but whitewash something. I'm really irritated we're not taking these things seriously. And we, the international system is imperfect. But we can look at where it has worked, and we can help make it work better. I'd much rather confront these things directly than pretend the world is different than it actually is. We've had 25 years of, in my view, almost unmitigated failure in addressing climate change. There's still tiny you know, uh, spots of light here and there, of course, especially in Europe. But on the whole, you know, failure. Uh, this is an unprecedented problem. And I think we would do better if we took that very seriously. The biggest problem I have with Paris is if we think Paris is somehow going to solve something and we pursue the Paris line for another 10, 15 years, just like we've done in all the previous negotiations, and we neglect other alternatives. The, the last thing I want to say is that these coordination alternatives, they're not alternatives. We can do both. So you can keep everything from Paris. People can do that and be happy with it. You can still have these other agreements. They're not mutually exclusive. Having one does not hurt the other. And that's what I, and by the way, I have spoken to people who are involved at the highest level on these points for quite some time, and at least some people have assured me that this is what they want to do. But I think you do need national governments, the civil society, academics, others pushing this. Uh, because the idea that we're going to place all our bets, all these poker chips, on the current process, we've already given it 25 years. It's time for some new ideas, some new approaches.